Hey, hi everyone! Welcome to Unit Three AP Biology Review. Um, today we're going to be talking about cellular energetics. Uh, my name is Ambika, and as always, please feel free to leave constructive criticisms. Please tell us if our slideshows aren't helping, if the slides are ugly, if just just anything we can improve on. We'd really uh, appreciate it. So, without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so topics covered. Um, here's the topics. They're in accordance with the AP Biology course and exam description. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so topic 3.1 is enzyme structure. So what do you have to know about enzyme structure? Basically, you have to know what an enzyme substrate complex is. So the substrate is what binds to the enzyme. Um, so as we see in this picture over here, and they're able to bind to each other because of an induced fit. Now, what that means is that, do you see this like McDonald's shaped um, shape over here? Um, the enzyme has that exact same complementary shape. So because of that, they're able to have an induced fit, which some AP bio teachers describe as a lock and key fit. No, so basically the shape of the substrate and the enzyme has to be compatible for a reaction to occur and the substrate binds to the active site. All right, topic 3.2 is enzyme catalysis. So as we'll see later in this slideshow, enzymes carry out almost all of our biological processes. Um, if you've taken chemistry or if you're familiar with the term catalyst, that's basically a chemical that speeds up the rate of a reaction. And that's exactly what enzymes do. Um, so they're biological catalysts and they're catalysts because they lower the activation energy for the reaction to occur. Activation energy is the amount of energy you need to do a reaction. So if you look at this little picture over here, First off, we can tell that this is an exothermic reaction because the line for products are lower than the line for the reactants, meaning that energy has been released. If you look at the reaction without an enzyme, we can see that it takes a lot more energy to do the reaction, whereas with an enzyme, it significantly lowers that initial energy needed to do the reaction. And that's why it speeds up reactions. All right, topic 3.3 is environmental impacts on enzyme function. And this basically refers to an enzyme being denatured. Um, and that's when the structure is altered, meaning that the enzyme is ruined and it can't really do its, like what it's supposed to do, which is a major problem since we just talked about how it mediates a lot of our um, processes. So there's a couple of ways an enzyme can be denatured, um, with two of them being temperature changes and pH level. Um, basically, if it's like too hot or something, the enzyme's not going to be in its optimal range. Uh, and the same goes with pH. If it's too acidic or if it's like outside of its acidity range, it's not going to carry out properly. Um, in some cases, denaturation can be reversed, meaning that if you go back to its optimal range, um, the enzyme will start working just fine. Enzyme efficiency. Um, so one of the main topics here is that if you have more substrate, um, that's going to make the reaction go faster. Um, and again, if you're familiar with chemistry, you'll know that this has to do with collision theory. If you have more substrate, if you have more like atoms or molecules or whatever it may be, um, they're going to collide more frequently because there's more of them, right? There's a higher probability of that happening, and that increases the rate of the reaction. The same can go with temperature. Um, basically, since temperature is proportional to average kinetic energy, which is the energy of movement, um, like the, the substrates are going to move faster and it's going to speed up the rate of the reaction. Okay, so for the exam, there's two types of inhibitors that are discussed. Um, the first one is a competitive inhibitor, which basically binds to the active site. So that's what this first part shows over here. As you can see, both the substrate and the inhibitor have the same induced fit. Um, so it's able to bind at the active site. The second type is a non-competitive inhibitor, which can't bind um, at the active site. But what it can do is it can bind allosterically. So even though it's not binding at the active site, as you can see, when it binds over here, it kind of like forces the thing to be shape, uh, to change shape, and that's what doesn't allow that substrate to bind. Okay, topic 3.4 is cellular energy. So, it's pretty obvious that energy is really important to life, um, and life does require order to happen, but this doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics and entropy, which we'll talk about in a bit. 
Um, in order to have some net energy, you have to gain more than you lose, um, which, which makes sense because if you had equal amounts, then you'd have absolutely no energy. And so this is able to happen because of redox reactions and energy coupling. Uh, when it says energy coupling, it refers to endergonic and exergonic reactions. Um, and then a total loss of order and or energy results in death. So if you look at the two pictures over here, um, it just kind of talks about entropy um, and order in a system. Okay, so now let's talk about Gibbs free energy and the second law of thermodynamics. So I believe this equation is on the AP um, bio sh like equation sheet, so you don't have to memorize it, and I doubt that they're going to make you calculate something with it. If anything, it'll be just conceptual. So the second law of thermodynamics states that as energy is transferred, a lot of it is wasted. Um, and this ties in with entropy because that's basically how disordered a system is. Um, and by system, I mean like, um, you know, like a, a coalition of like all the molecules or, or like where, wherever it may be, just where that energy is like being transferred to. Um, so yeah, entropy measures how much energy is not available to do work. Uh, if you're like familiar with like physics, you know, you know that work is basically just transferring energy. And then Gibbs free energy is the sum of enthalpy and the product of temperature and entropy of a system. In this equation, while you'll see it's a minus is because this is negative. So you're, cause it's like energy not available to do work. So um, you're adding a negative, which is you're subtracting. Energy pathways. So in a lot of biological systems, in order to conserve like as much energy like we just talked about, um, the pathways follow a sequential order. And this is evident in like photosynthesis, respiration, um, in where the product of one step of a reaction is the reactant to the next step. So an example over here is pyruvate. We know that's made in glycolysis after it breaks down glucose. Um, and the mitochondria, after it leaves the cytosol, it's converted to acetyl coenzyme A. And then acetyl coenzyme A is used in the Krebs cycle. Okay, topic 3.5 is photosynthesis. So, before we start talking about photosynthesis and respiration, it's important that we understand that both are redox reactions. So, I'll explain what that means here. Um, reduction basically means to gain an electron, and oxidation means to lose an electron. I know it's kind of counterintuitive, but here's why. Um, it refers to oxidation numbers or charges. Like some elements, their charge is their oxidation number. But basically, since electrons are negative, like minus one, um, when you gain that electron, your charge or your oxidation number is going down, so it's being reduced. Um, and then oxidation, when you lose that electron, it's becoming more positive. And then I always use the acronym LEO the lion goes GER, which is lose electron oxidation and gain electron reduction. And that's exactly what this picture shows over here. Okay, so energy and photosynthesis. Um, as we just discussed earlier, organisms capture and store energy to use in their biological processes. So photosynthesis, it gets its energy from the sun or light and it uses it to make sugar like glucose. Um, its reactions are carbon dioxide and water and its products are glucose and oxygen. Now, if you look at this picture over here, you'll see that photosynthesis and respiration are reverse of each other. So that's a very important um, Release the reactants of one process are the um, products of another, and vice versa. And then photosynthesis is a redox reaction like we discussed earlier. Okay, so photosynthesis and evolution. Um, photosynthesis does show evidence for evolution, and we know that because of a lot of evidence, it first evolved in prokaryotes like cyanobacteria. Um, a lot of scientists uh, have this theory, widely accepted theory, that it were cyanobacteria that were responsible for the atmosphere having oxygen uh, because that was not the case before. Um, so yeah, just know that eukaryotic photosynthesis comes from prokaryotic photosynthesis. Okay, so now let's talk about light-dependent reactions. It's like an organized series of reaction pathways that take energy from light or sunlight um, to make ATP, and it reduces NAD+, plus, NADP+, plus to make NADPH, um, and that powers the Calvin cycle to make your glucose. All right, so let's do a basic rundown of photosynthesis. So we know 
that in the light-dependent reactions, um, chlorophylls absorb energy from light. And that makes the electron that we get from splitting water super excited and like a high energy electron. And that electron basically travels down this path between between the uh, chemiosmotic gradient, uh, which is in the electron transport chain. And then just know that the splitting of water releases oxygen as a byproduct. And we know that oxygen is needed for um, respiration. Okay, so the electron transport chain, like I just mentioned, it has that chemiosmotic gradient with hydrogen ions from that high to low concentration. So they're traveling in that order. And what happens is that they, um, the ions go through ATP synthase, which is an enzyme, and it makes um, ATP from adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate. Um, qualitatively, you have to know that the energy from light gets transferred to ATP and NADPH, and that's used to power the Kalman cycle, which happens in the stroma. Uh, and then in photosynthesis, the final electron acceptor is NADP+. Okay, so before I move on to respiration, I just want to point out that um, please don't waste time memorizing all of the little details, like all the enzymes, all of the little like things that happen in between each process, because the AP exam is not like fact and recall. It's not going to ask you like in what step is um, like pyruvate produced in. Rather, it'll ask you to apply those concepts. So just knowing what comes out of each step is much more beneficial. And these were taken from the um, from the course and exam description, so I'm not making this up. Okay, topic 3.6 is cellular respiration. Okay, so oh, energy and respiration. We know that fermentation and respiration get their energy from our food, um, which is broken down into biological macromolecules to make ATP. We also know that all life forms either respire or do fermentation which is another conserved process that we'll explore in Unit 7. Like photosynthesis, we know that respiration happens in a lot of steps, uh, with each step having some sort of enzymes controlling it. And we know that respiration is an aerobic process because it needs oxygen. Okay, so we're revisiting the idea of electron transport change. So now we know that they're in both photosynthesis and um, respiration. But basically, it transfers energy from electrons from previously coupled reactions to make that gradient across your membranes. There's that difference in potential energy between the high and low concentration of your uh, hydrogen proton. So we know that these reactions happen in the mitochondria, chloroplasts, and then in uh, single cell organisms like prokaryotes, they happen in the plasma membrane. Um, in respiration, your two electron carriers to know are NADH and FEDH2, and their whole job is basically just to deliver electrons from, uh, from glycolysis and the Krebs cycle to reach oxygen, which you see right here, and that makes uh, water as a byproduct. ATP synthase. So I know I mentioned this earlier, but basically the reason why it's able to make ATP is because the when the uh, when the ions are going from a high to low concentration, they spin the enzyme, and that makes your ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. So this process is called oxidative phosphorylation in respiration, and it's called photophosphorylation in photosynthesis. Glycolysis. Okay, so we know that this releases energy from glucose to make ATP. Uh, it makes pyruvate and it reduces NAD plus to make NADH. We know that's being reduced because it's gaining that hydrogen. Um, pyruvate goes from the cytosol to the mitochondria and it's converted into acetyl coenzyme A, which is then used in the Krebs cycle. Okay, so now let's talk about the Krebs cycle. Basically, if you have to pick something to know from the Krebs cycle, just know that carbon dioxide is released, know that some ATP is made, and know that your electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, get even more electrons. Again, you don't have to know this, like all the um, all the little in-betweens, like all the intermediates, just know the general um, products of each step. Fermentation. So, fermentation is an anaerobic process. Um, for example, if you like run track, for example, and you, you know, you start running long distances and you're low on oxygen, you might notice that your muscles might start cramping and that's because they're doing um, lactic acid fermentation. And what it does is it allows for glycolysis to continue because it regenerates NAD plus. 
which is what this picture shows over here. Um, as you can see, they're just regenerating NAD+, and it produces either lactate or ethanol as a byproduct because there's two types of fermentation. There's lactic acid and there's alcohol fermentation. Another key part to know from this process is that converting ATP to ADP releases energy, and that's used to power a lot of processes. Okay, the last section is fitness. Um, basically, what they want you to know is that um, similarly to like how um, like genetic variation makes like organisms fit, just having a lot of variety and diversity, uh, the same thing can be applied to molecules. So that's kind of what we see in, um, in this unit. Like there's so many things involved in both photosynthesis and respiration. And because of that, organisms can respond to a lot of different types of stimuli. Uh, and that allows for them to like survive and reproduce in different environments. An example of this, I guess, would be like food. Like a lot of foods that you eat, like no matter what it is, it'll have some type of um, macromolecule that, that can be used to make energy. Um, so yeah, this was, uh, that's a wrap for units, unit three of AP Biology. Please let us know if this was useful, if I spoke too fast, if, if there's anything we can do to help you, please let us know. Um, also let us know if there are, um, if you guys want us to like do guided FRQs, we'll try to do those. Um, but please comment any constructive criticisms and 